Hi guys, Victoria Paxton here. Thanks for stopping back by my YouTube channel. Okay, so today, drum roll please. Ah, River Phoenix. Okay, it's going to be a long one y'all. There's a lot, even though we had a short life, there's a lot of details that I need to read and I hate sitting here reading to the camera, but that's what I'm gonna be doing. So you might wanna grab a snack or if you could start like sweeping your floor or dusting or something while you're listening to my gravelly deep voice because I was a smoker for many years and thankfully quit 10 years ago, so. Okay, so River Jude Phoenix was born August 23rd, 1970 in Madras, Oregon. You know, I suck with pronunciation, so I don't want people coming at me in the comments, okay? He was the first child of Arlene Dunetz and John Lee Bottom. Phoenix's parents named him after the River of Life from the Herman Hess novel Siddhartha. I know I said that wrong. <laughs> and he received his middle name from the Beatles song, Hey Jude. Those are some hippie loving people right there. In an interview with People, River said his parents were hippie-ish. Yeah, there you go. His mom was born in New York to Jewish parents whose families had immigrated from Russia and Hungary. His father was a lapsed Catholic. What the heck's a lapsed Catholic? His father was a lapsed Catholic from Fontana, California of English, German, and French ancestry. In 1968, Phoenix's mom traveled across the U.S., while hitchhiking in California, she met John Lee Bottom. They married on September 13th, 1969, less than a year after meeting. River's family moved across country when he was very young. Okay, so Phoenix later stated that they lived in a very desperate situation. That's not good. Phoenix often played guitar while he and his sister sang, sang on street corners for money and food to support their ever-growing family. Phoenix never attended formal school. When I read that, my mind was just blown. Like, this kid never went to school. Not even, like, homeschool, like, nothing. Okay, screenwriter Naomi Finer later commented, quote, He was totally, totally without education. I mean, he could read and write, and he had an appetite for it, but he had no deep roots into any kind of sense of history or literature. Close quote. That's sad, because his parents... You know, they were obviously, for whatever reason or purpose, they were like deep rooted in their beliefs. So it's sad that they didn't do more for their kids. I mean, anyway, that's just my opinion. George Schlusser claimed River was dyslexic. I mean, that could very well be. The child could have been dyslexic. In 1973, the family joined a religious cult named the Children of God. This cult is scary, y'all. I was looking stuff up. Scary. Like child molestation and all kinds of stuff. It was scary. The family had settled in Caracas, 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 Venezuela, where the children of God had stationed them to work as missionaries and fruit gatherers. Although Phoenix rarely talks about the cult, he was quoted by Arlen Phoenix in a 1994 Esquire article as having said, quote, they're disgusting, they're ruining people's lives, close quote. And boy, he wasn't kidding. He lived it, he knows, you know. According to the Vanity Fair magazine, Phoenix was raped at the age of four. Freaking believable. D Don't even get me going. In an interview with Details magazine in November of 91, Phoenix stated he lost his virginity at the age of four while in the children of God. But I've blocked it out, is what he said. Okay, so if that's true, that's not losing your virginity. That's being molested and abused. Years later, his brother Joaquin would claim that River was joking, completely saying, quote, it was a complete and total joke. It was just it was just effing with the press. It was literally a joke because he was tired of being asked ridiculous questions by the press. Close quote. I hope for River's sake that that's the truth, that I really hope that he wasn't molested at four, but why would you say that? You know what I mean? Like 
It's not something you would just make up. So maybe Joaquin was just trying to cover. I don't know. Okay. Um, Arlen and John eventually grew disillusioned with the children of God. Arlen would later tell a journalist, journalist that she and her husband were opposed to the group's practice of, quote, flirty fishing, close quote, stating the group was being distorted by the leader, David Burke, who was getting powerful and wealthy. He sought to attract rich disciples through sex. No way, close quote. In the late 70s, Rivers' family moved in with Arlene, Arlen's parents in Florida. The family officially claimed... What? <laughs> the family officially changed their name to Phoenix after the mystical bird that rises from its own ashes, symbolizing a new life. Here we go. That's nice. Back in the U.S., Arlen began working as a secretary for an NBC broadcaster and John as an exterior architect. Well, dag on. The dad was an architect? That's crazy. Talent agent Iris Burton spotted River, Joaquin, and their sister Summer and Rain singing for spare change in Westwood, Los Angeles, and was so charmed by the family that she soon represented the four siblings. I mean, thank goodness they... She found... I mean, because could you imagine, like, these kids would go through life with no education, and what, what would they do? I mean, you know... River started doing commercials for Mitsubishi, Ocean Spray, and Saks Fifth Avenue. And soon afterward, he and the other children were signed by casting director Penny Marshall, Laverne from Laverne and Shirley, from Paramount Pictures. She was a cool, cool lady. River and Rain were assigned immediately to a show called Real Kids as warm-up performance for the audience. In 1980, River began to fully pursue his work as an actor, making his first appearance on a TV show called Fantasy, singing with his sister Rain. In 1982, River was cast in the short-lived CBS television series, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. He starred as the youngest brother, Guthrie McFadden. You know what? I remember that show. I remember that show. At 15 years old, River had a significant role in Rob Reiner's popular coming-of-age film, Stand By Me, in 1986. For his role in My Own Private Idaho, River won Best Actor Honors at the Venice Film Festival, the National Society of Film Critics, and the Independent Spirit Awards. Wow. The film and its success solidified River's image as an actor with edgy leading man potential. During this period of time, River had begun using marijuana, cocaine, and heroin with his friends. In a book later written about River, the writer said, River did drugs occasionally. It was said he had a bigger struggle with alcohol. So sad. River always tried to hide his addictions because he was afraid it would ruin his career. River starred in Peter... Bogdanovich's country music themed film, The Thing Called Love, in 1993. It was the last completed picture before his death. River began a relationship with his co star, Samantha Mathis, on the set. During his life, River was a dedicated animal rights, environmental, and political activist. He was a prominent spokesperson for PETA and won their humanitarian award in 1992 for his fundraising efforts. Okay, y'all. On the evening of October 30th of 1993, River was set to perform with the band P, which featured his good friends Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I can tell you all about that band from when I worked backstage. Yeah. <laughs> Actor Johnny Depp, Gibby Haynes of the Butthole Surfers, along with Al Jorgensen of Ministry of Ministry at the Viper Room. It was a Hollywood nightclub partly owned by Johnny Depp at the time. Bob Forrest, okay, so he was a bandmate and later became a drug counselor, claims that River and Frusciante arrived at the club together where they would meet up with River's girlfriend, Samantha Mathis, River's brother, Joaquin, and their sister, Rain, along with Flea and Depp. So after arriving, cocaine was immediately passed around. Forrest later said that River was obviously already high and he was unsteady. So by the time River got there, he was already high and having issues. During the performance, River tapped Forrest on the shoulder to tell him he was sick and he thought he may have overdosed. Forrest said he didn't think that he had overdosed because he could stand and talk. He offered to take River home, but River declined, saying he felt better. Really, River? A few moments later, Forrest said there was a commotion that erupted outside at the entrance to the Viper Room. He went outside to find Mathis screaming as her boyfriend was laying on the sidewalk convulsing. That's so sad. Joaquin dialed 911 but was unable to tell if River was breathing. 
His sister, Rain, proceeded to give him CPR. When the ambulance arrived, Phoenix was still alive and Flea went with him to Cedar sinai Hospital. When Forrest arrived at the hospital, he saw Mathis in the hallway crying. Further attempts to resuscitate River were unsuccessful. He was pronounced dead at 1.51 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the morning of October 31st at the age of 23. <sighs> okay. Everyone went on to blame Frusciante for giving River the drugs that killed him. The November 15, 1993 autopsy found the toxicology study showed high concentrations of morphine and cocaine in the blood, as well as other substances in smaller concentrations. The cause of death was acute multiple drug intoxications. So sad. I don't know what these... Yeah, it's just sad. Addiction sucks, y'all. Okay, so... I was able to connect with River. He came through. He looked to be like maybe 20. He was very polite and soft-spoken and almost kind of like introverted. Yeah, it was weird. It's not totally not what I expected. You know what I mean? Um, so he went on to talk about his siblings. Um, okay. So he talked all about his siblings and, you know, that he's still able to see them, which is good, I guess. Um, so then he went on to start talking about how much he regretted the end of his life and how he really let his fans down and how disappointed in himself he's been. And, you know, he said he finally came to a point in life to where he forgave himself but he said, you know, he felt like he let everybody he knew down. You know, he said his friends, his family and his fans. He said, you know, I wasn't a big, huge drug addict. It's not like I did drugs all day, every day. You know, I, I didn't do drugs that often. Um, but he said he knows that everybody was disappointed in him when they found out how he died. And it, he said, you know, it hurt his heart. You know, he was really felt really bad about it. Um, so he, I said, you know, um, okay. So he said when he went up to talk to his friend, Bob, he said like he knew right away. Why do I keep going blurry? He knew right away that something wasn't right. He said he could just feel it in his body. And, you know, Bob was like, oh, you know, I don't think you're, you've overdosed because you're standing here. You're talking to me. You seem fine. You know, we can just let me take you home or we can keep an eye on it. And he was like, oh, no, I'll be OK. And then he said before he knew it, something he knew something wasn't right. He said something to his girlfriend and his girlfriend and Joaquin helped walk him outside to get some fresh air, thinking that would help. And that was the last thing that he remembered. And he said, I, I don't know how, but I knew I knew like right away that I had overdosed. Um, he said, but Bob kept saying that, you know, I had an overdose and he knows what he's talking about. So I assumed, you know, well, maybe I didn't overdose, you know? Um, but he said, you know, he wanted to reiterate that drugs weren't an all day, every day part of his life. It was an occasional thing he did with specific friends. Um, I went on to talk to him about how everybody blamed uh, for Shanti for giving him the drugs. Um, so here was his take on that. He said, even though I was young, I was a grown man and it was my decision to take those drugs. I could have walked away and said, no, um, I chose to take them. Now, you know, Frushant, he said, Frushante had no way of knowing his friend had no way of knowing if it was going to cause an overdose. You know, he's like, that's the risk you take with drugs. You, you don't know. And he said, you know, I don't blame, I don't blame him for anything. I'm a grown, I was a grown man. I chose to do it. He said, but you know, he had some stuff in his system before he even got there. And he said, you know, I knew better. I, I, I knew better, you know? 
So I asked him if he would talk about, you know, his life leading up to that day. And here's another one, y'all. Here's another one. He said, again, he was feeling very lonely. He said, I had a girlfriend. I had a great family, a great group of friends, but I just felt lonely. You know, he said, I, I felt lonely. It's just so sad. Like, yeah, he went on to talk about how um, he loved being a part of PETA. He loved being an activist. And he said, I think that's why I feel like I let everybody down. Because that had become my life mantra. And then all of a sudden, here I am dead from drug, a drug overdose. You know? Um, you know, and he went on to talk about how he would get on such a automatic high when he was doing a film. And then when it was over, it was like this big letdown time until he started doing another film. And I guess he said he had talked to some people, some actors about that and that everybody basically feels like that, you know, that it's like this major high. And then when the, when the movie's done, it's like, okay. You know, he was talking about that. That was pretty interesting. I thought, you know, here's the other thing. So here's what I want to say. Okay. What was he? 23 when he died, I would have to look back, but, um, the bottom line is he came across so not only was he introverted and shy, but he came across was just, he just, it felt like he was so much older. Like he was so much more mature. Like he knew so much for his short 23 years, you know, it was just strange because he just came through as being, you know, had this plethora of knowledge, which, you know what I mean? He just came through so much older. Um, he was a really cool guy. Um, you know, he talked about depression, you know, not just from like when the movie was done and then, but he said just depression and being alone and, you know, all the time type of thing. And, um, he talked about how proud he is of his siblings and everything they've accomplished and, yeah, he was a cool guy. Really was. Um, yeah. And I'll say this again. He was very easy on the eyes, too. So, <laughs> okay, guys. Be nice. Be kind. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Look out for your friends and family. Check on them. Make sure they're okay. See if there's anything they need. We'll get through this together. And... That about does it for me. Bye, guys.